Tom has a long and illustrious career in, uh, in landscape, horticulture, and nursery, stretching over 30 years. Um, and uh, notwithstanding his location in California, I know that he's done uh, consulting work across North America. Uh, he's been a nurseryman, a landscaper, a horticulture teacher. Uh, he has authored no less than six books on various topics on allergies and, and gardens, as well as innumerable periodical articles. Um, I thought it was, uh, when I looked at his, his bio, uh, Tom is truly a um, lifelong learner. He got his first degree in 1967 and his most recent degree in 1998. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're very pleased to have uh, Tom talk to us about the issues of sex in the garden tonight. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Inga. Uh, are we all ready to rock and roll here then? We are. Just get a little closer, talk a little louder, and uh, you might want to hit slideshow and so we don't okay. see your side now, hits. Hit slideshow. Yep. yep. Click okay. on that. Yep. Just like okay. yesterday. Now, what can you see of the slideshow? We, we, we can... see exactly what you see. Oh, so you can see the stuff on the left too? Yeah. yeah. So if you hit that slideshow button on the top where you were, just hit it hard enough that it does something. Okay. There and way go. over on the left from beginning, hit yeah. that. Hit from beginning. Yep. Ah. Ah, there so, you go. There we go. You guys oh, are right. you guys okay. are so smart. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, let me just get going here. Um, yeah, we I do have the first apricot blossoms uh, just started to show up the last couple of days, um, and it's actually still kind of cold, but uh, as a hardcore gardener, when you see that first uh, blossom, it, it makes you feel like spring's on its way, you know. Um, I will explain safe sex in your garden uh, as we move along here. Um, I've been talking about safe sex in the garden for years. In fact, I wrote a book on it uh, called that. But uh, nowadays they're calling it, um, in the media, they're calling it botanical sexism. This is um, one of many articles that were written recently about botanical sexism. Uh, and I'm credited with coming up with the term botanical sexism, but I don't ever remember being that clever. Uh, I, I think some, some writer, some journalist came up with it and then everybody started copying it, but they gave it to me. But uh, the sexism involved is that there's a predominance of male plants in the urban landscape. Um, in, uh, oh, I don't know, eight, nine years ago or something, I did a allergy audit of the uh, 11 largest cities in Canada. I drove my old truck from uh, Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, where I took the ferry over to the island and I drove all the way to uh, Halifax. And I, uh, I did uh, a couple weeks in each town and did assessments of, of what was planted in the town and how allergenic it was and how male or female it was and what they were selling in the nurseries. And I was paid to do that by Johnson and Johnson on a allergy promotion thing. But uh, as a result, I've got a pretty good idea of what, what's grown in Canada. Um, this is a pollen grain. Now that pollen grains magnified, you know, God, I don't know, millions of times. Uh, and a pollen grain is not really soft. It's actually kind of hard. And sometimes they're round, and sometimes they're flat, and all different shapes. Every species has its own shape. Uh, some shape like this uh, can cause problems, even if you don't have allergies, just because it, it gets in your eyes and you, and you rub it, and, and you can pretty much figure out what happened just by looking at the pollen grain. Uh, 
the outside of the pollen grain is called the X time and it's allergenic. Uh, the inside is much more allergenic. And uh, with the increase in uh, climate change and CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, we're getting a lot of instances where, uh, particularly in areas with a lot of uh, vehicle traffic, where pollen grains uh, will explode. And uh, when they explode, a, a grain like this may burst into a thousand pieces and then they become what's called particulates. They're also very small and so you can inhale them deep into the lung triggering asthma. But the inside of the pollen grain, which is called the end time, is, is like 10 times more allergenic than the outside. So when these grains start fracturing, we, we get into some real serious health problems. And by the way, on days with high pollen counts, deaths from all causes, all causes rise rather dramatically. So there may be on a high pollen count day, you may have 20% more deaths just from heart disease. Uh, the pollen acts as a, uh, an inflammatory agent. And anything that's an inflammatory agent uh, is something that we don't need to have too much of at any one time. Anyhow, uh, my motivation. This is my wife, Yvonne, uh, with a, holding a, a cake she makes every year at 4th of July. And uh, Yvonne and I have been married uh, as of February 11th, 54 years. Uh, she's put up with a lot, uh, but uh, Yvonne has asthma and very bad allergies, and um, she's had asthma since she was a baby, and whenever her allergies get bad, then her asthma gets bad, and there's been a number of times when I thought my wife was going to die, I mean, within the hour. Uh, so scary from, from asthma attacks. And, and I'm happy to say that she hasn't had an asthma attack like that in uh, over a decade now, but um, I've been manipulating my own environment. Uh, but sh she's my motivation for this. People assume I have a lot of allergies. Uh, and that's not the case, although I'm starting to get some. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's for love of my wife, I started to study this. Uh, and I started to study allergy-free gardening because nobody else was doing it. And I thought it was about time. Um, proximity and pollen dispersal. Let me talk about this for a minute and I'll show a few slides on it. People have the idea that, that pollen travels for thousands of miles and everything. And, and generally that's not true at all. A typical tree, 99% uh, of the pollen will fall out within 150 feet of the tree. Um, therefore, whatever you plant and where you plant makes a big difference. So if you say you wanted to have a, a very allergenic shrub or something, but you just because you loved it for some reason, uh, you wouldn't want to plant it underneath your kid's bedroom window, or you wouldn't want to plant it right next to your front door, or your back door you want to plant it way back in your yard. Uh, the proximity is everything because the closer you are to the source, the more pollen you always get. There, there are really no exceptions to this. Uh, this is an example of a house. Uh, this is a bedroom at the house. The windows open when it gets warm. The two shrubs on either side of it are, are male yew pines, which are a relative of of the type of yew that you would grow in Canada. And like the yews, they're separate sex. And like the yews, they're poisonous. And like the yews, the males produce huge amount of pollen and the females produce fruit. Now, in this particular picture, both of these, these shrub trees uh, are male and they will bloom precisely about the time it gets warm enough to uh, open up the windows for some fresh air in the spring. That, that pollen will go right through the window screen just like it's not even there. Uh, I have probably had more cases of um, unusual people getting sick that nobody could figure out what was wrong and then we trace it to either these shrubs or use males 
planted uh, typically by bedroom windows. At nighttime, the people are getting uh, showered with this pollen. And again, it's not just allergenic, it's poisonous. Um, I don't know why I put this in. Remember, ladies, uh, <laughs> Tulip, Rose, and Daisy attend their first Plant Parenthood meeting on Ode to Spring. It's springtime when the blossom grows, cramming pollen up my nose. Um, this is taken in Toronto, in, near your area. And uh, that's a male maple tree and uh, red maple. And you can see the pollen on the ground underneath the, you, or you can see it in the street anyhow. Uh, there will be even more pollen falling on the grass. The pollen that falls on the grass will often stay there. The pollen that falls on cement or other hard surface will get picked up by the wind and it moved around and it caused more problem. But the, back to the proximity, the closer you are to that tree, to where you're in that heavy pollen zone, that's where you get your allergies and asthma triggered. Um, this is the first book I wrote about the subject 20 years ago now, uh, Allergy-Free Gardening. I had already spent a dozen years working on this book, and it had 360 rejections on it by publishers when I finally suddenly got two publishers that were interested. And uh, I guess that shows if you're persistent enough, things will happen. Um, a note about opals. In all of my books, we use opal scales. Opal stands for Ogren Plant Allergy Scale. Uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's used by uh, many organizations, many cities worldwide. It's the only recognized uh, numerical plant allergy scale. And uh, there are actually some nurseries that sell plants with opals tags, which is something I would love to see happen. And um, I don't charge the nurseries anything. I mean, I make very little money, honest. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter because I'm trying to do something. But uh, the reason I came up with the opals is a lot of people are, are maybe, they're not like my audience here, that I, you that I'm talking to today they don't know that much about plants and they look at a plant and they go, Oh, I like the looks of that. And then if they saw the tag and it said allergy friendly or low risk or something, they go, Oh, okay. It won't cause allergies. I'll buy it. Now, if there was truth in, in uh, lending truth in selling, uh, like we have labels on the cans of food we buy and so on. If that, plant you were going to buy what's going to cause extreme allergies, uh, nine or a 10 on that opal scale, I feel it ought to be on the tag. And nurseries, of course, most of them don't like that idea, but uh, the consumers like the idea. And the nurseries that are using that are finding it's uh, actually increased sales, not decreased them. Uh, these are some examples of some opal tags that are being used in Europe. Um, this is a fellow over on the island of Guernsey uh, in the English Channel. And every plant in that greenhouse, and it's a very big greenhouse, much bigger than you could tell from the photo, every plant in that is a female. They're all grown asexually from cuttings, and they're maybe 30, 40 different species of plants in there. Every one of them is, is female. Every one of them is 100% pollen free. Uh, all of these plants will trap pollen, but they will not release pollen. I mentioned the money because the nurseries uh, seem to think I'm trying to break the nurseries, and yet I used to be in the nursery business. but. Actually, the, nursery, the few nurseries that have adopted this are making money. They're not losing money. People like it. Um, this is a, a mock-up 
of a uh, new housing development going in San Luis Obispo, California, where I live. And it's called San Luis Ranch. And it's gonna have 580 new homes. And it's gonna have uh, a hotel and a small commercial area. And 100% of it is gonna be done uh, per opals to be allergy friendly. It's gonna it's uh, mm, they'll be planting things there within a year. It's going to make a big splash. Uh, you never find people that would say that they didn't want to live in an area that was landscaped to be allergy friendly. Nobody objects to that. Uh, it's all win-win. Uh, safe sex in the garden. This was second book I published on this subject. Uh, we just look at a few flowers. So now, okay, I can't hear the people so that are in my audience here. Um, but uh, so I, it's hard for me to ask you questions, but I, I suppose you recognize this is a, a flower of a red maple. And so the question I would say, is this a male flower or a female? Now, go ahead and decide. And then I'll tell you, well, that's the female flower. And the two wings are the wings you see on a wing seed. The seed only coming from the female tree. That's the male uh, version, a totally different tree. And every one of these little points on the end of it, the anthers, Every one of them has thousands of grains of, of quite allergenic pollen. Uh, that doesn't mean not to plant red maples. It means to plant the female ones, not the males. Um, this is a deodar cedar in my front yard. It's a in whole tree is female, uh, produces no pollen. There, this is off a of male. These are male cones. This is what the male cones look like when they fall and hit the sidewalk. Um, now here's a plant that I assume pretty much everybody knows. Uh, this is a holly. And so I ask you, is this holly male or is it female? Hopefully I've been connecting enough here that you can see that this holly is a female. Now that means that this holly will make fruit. It will never produce any pollen. It will trap pollen from male hollies and it will turn them into fruit. Uh, is the pollen from a male holly allergenic? Uh, yes, quite allergenic. Not sure what that is. All right. This is a uh, forestiria. This is a native plant that grows all the way from Mexico up into Canada. I've got some in my own yard. It makes a beautiful small tree. Uh, it's called desert olive, but it'll grow pretty much anywhere. Very tough, easy to grow. And, they, and they're all separate sexed. And this one is a, is it a male or a female? Uh, it's a female. You see the fruit. Uh, the birds like the fruit, by the way. And I meant to throw a, a, a few photos of songbirds into here. I'm a birder. I've got, what have I got? I don't know, 1,022 different species of birds on my life list now. Um, and I have done some good birding in Canada at your, what is it called? Rondeau National Park. Wonderful place. But uh, the wild birds are very important in the yard uh, for many reasons. And one of the reasons that they keep, they cut down on allergies is these small birds like uh, warblers and bush tits and so on, they eat constantly and they eat all these tiny insects that get on plants. And when they eat those insects, they clean up the plant and make the plant healthier and they reduce the amount of insect dander. And by doing that, they also reduce mold spores because sucking insects like aphids will uh, produce what's called honeydew and mold spores grow on that. So if you have a, 
a tree that always looks dirty, it's probably because it's covered with mold. And in that case, it's very allergenic. Um, these are three uh, new clone, very popular called Skyrocket Juniper. And these are all males. They will all produce a, a lot of pollen and they will all produce a lot of allergies. Now, probably four out of five of the junipers that are sold are males or maybe higher percentage than that. And, and yet there are other junipers like blue arrow on the left and blue moffet on the right, both of which uh, are very similar to skyrocket in shape form, but they're female and they will make juniper berries and they are pollen free, allergy free, opals number one. This is a close up of a male juniper. Um, not only are the apricots starting to bloom in my area, but the, the juniper bushes and the cypress bushes are loading up with pollen cones. And each one of these little cones that you see holds tens of thousands of grains of pollen, exceptionally allergenic. Um, this is, uh, I took this shot down in Texas. You know, I got this down in Texas. Uh, I was giving talks near San Antonio. They have an awful lot of junipers there. And along with it, they have what they call cedar fever and cedar is what they call juniper. But, uh, and then here's the same tree with a, a burst of wind hitting it. And that's not smoke coming off it, it's pollen. Um, it, it's interesting thing, uh, in the wild lands around uh, San Antonio, Texas, and in a lot of Texas, um, there's so many of these native junipers, ashy junipers growing, that they use them for fence posts and firewood. But the people who cut them, the loggers, they've discovered that they don't think of the trees are male or female, but they notice that some trees have berries and some don't. And they notice that when they're cutting the trees with berries, it doesn't make them sick. But when they're cutting the trees without berries, uh, it, they'll start getting allergic and feel bad. And so what they do is they normally only cut down the, the ones with the berries and those are the females. So they're leaving systematically, uh, unintentionally, they're leaving millions of more male junipers in the wild, which is making the allergies in Texas worse as though they don't have enough problems in Texas right now. <laughs> um, this is a weeping willow tree. Uh, in my own town, I actually grew this tree uh, from a cutting and gave it to these people uh, years ago. This is a uh, Salix babylonica. It's the true weeping willow. It is a female tree. Um, very nice tree, easy to grow. Unfortunately, uh, weeping willow trees don't live a long time. And a lot of the the, the female ones, the Salix Babylonica, they got old and they died and they cut them down and then they replaced them with golden willow. Now, the first time I, I drove through Canada, I saw thousands of this type of willow. And then 20 years later, when I drove through, what I saw was thousands of this type of willow and golden willow is a male and you can see all the little pollen cones there. Uh, another version of male golden willow. Now, I, because this group, because you participate in planting trees or you influence planting trees, uh, I would encourage you to look at some of your separate sex native species, your, a lot of your maples, uh, all of your willows, um, box elders, things like this. And it, when you find one that's female, uh, put a tag on it. And then the next season, take cuttings off of that, turn them into trees and give them away or sell them or whatever, but uh, encourage the planting of females. Um, it's hard to find a female willow at a nursery anymore. Um, 
This is uh, this is a photo close up of a male you that I took uh, probably in your area. And those are cones that are just about to burst with pollen. Each one of these cones will have like up to a million grains of pollen. And bear in mind that that pollen is very allergenic uh, and that it's toxic, it's cytotoxic, which means it kills cells. Now, there's a chemotherapy drug that's made from you called Taxol. And the chemotherapy drug is used mostly uh, against uh, breast cancer. And what, what the whole tree has the property, including the pollen. And, and, and what that does is it shuts down the production of estrogen. Now, estrogen, uh, you know, too much estrogen can make you fat, but uh, not enough es estrogen can make you mean or irritable. Uh, it can do all kinds of things. Your hair fall out. Uh, <laughs> it's not good. But uh, planting mill use right around your house is a recipe for uh, long-term bad health. Okay, now, because... Uh, this particular group and who you are, I'm gonna throw in a few things I wouldn't normally talk about. In uh, 2015, uh, Monty Quinter, I guess was his name, um, introduced a private member's bill called the Allergy Friendly Schoolyard Act. And this was supposed to go through but then they got into some political other problems, had nothing to do with this, and they never followed through with it. And it was a strong bill, and it was focused on something that I'm exceptionally interested in, which is schools. And this is some of the wording from that bill. No allergenic, male clonal, allergy-causing plants, shrubs, or trees should be planted in any schoolyard in the province of Ontario. Existing high allergy trees and shrubs in schoolyards should be removed and replaced with allergy-free or allergy-friendly plants. And they were using opals, uh, my organ plant allergy scale to uh, determine which was the most allergenic and which was the least. This, by the way, is a close-up of the benign plant, the female U. Now, interesting enough, everything on the U, including the pollen, is poisonous except for this red fruit. Uh, the red fruit, which actually doesn't taste bad, I've eaten it, um, it's not poisonous. However, the seeds are very poisonous. Uh, but if your if your U's make berries like this well then they're great if they never make any then then it's not good at all um this is a rather weird photo i think of an alpine current uh, this particular alpine current is a female um, i'm not sure in canada if they use alpine current i imagine they do i know in minnesota they used it a lot at, uh, for hedges uh, but it's a deciduous, tough plant, makes a good hedge. Uh, if you make it all in female, then the whole hedge is allergy fighting, meaning it traps pollen and it never produces any pollen. Uh, uh, an allergy free tall hedge in between you and a roadway is a very good idea because it will cut down. Uh, a huge amount of the pollen and, and bad things in the air coming off the roadway. By the way, the closer you live to a freeway, uh, the shorter your lifespan is expected to be. And the, and the closer you are to a freeway, the more important allergy-free gardening is because the, the closer you are to the freeway, 
the more pollution in the air and the more pollution in the air will trigger more pollen on male plants and it will make that pollen more allergenic, what they call super pollen. This is a, this is a yard and that whole lawn is female buffalo grass. Uh, I've got a, a much smaller lawn of female buffalo grass myself. I've got about mm, seven or eight different types of grasses that I grow, uh, which are separate sex and all of which are female, including some very nice ornamental uh, grasses that are all female. Um, but the the nice thing about the buffalo grass is it stays very low. I only mow mine once a year, and I only I hardly ever water it. But it it's uh, good, tough, and it's female, so it doesn't produce any pollen. Uh, this is a what they call a staminoid peony, and um, that's one area I'm jealous for about you guys is you can grow good peonies and we can't grow decent peonies in California. We just don't get enough winter cold. But many of the peonies, they've hybridized them so much for more and more doubleness or more and more petals. And the more petals you get, the fewer male stamens you get. And what happens at a certain point is all the male parts turn into petals, and then you have what's called a petaloid or a staminoid flower. And there are many plants in horticulture that are like that, and those are all pollen free or allergy free. Another example is a pollen free petaloid uh, tulip. Um, and now I'm not saying that tulips are a, a big pollen problem, <laughs> they're not. But nonetheless, it's interesting to know that you can, if you know what you're looking for, you can buy plants um, that are pollen free and nobody even tells you that. Uh, this is a, a, is a begonia. And this begonia is actually a male flower uh, tuberous begonia, but it again, it's been hybridized so much that all the, all the male parts, all the stamens have turned into petals. And it's hence pollen free flower. Uh, there's, a, there's a term in horticulture or botany called permanent juvenility. And there are certain plants that they take a cutting off of it when it's juvenile. And for some reason, it always stays juvenile. And there's quite a few plants like this, particularly with ground covers. But when you have permanent juvenility, like these, these junipers in this photo, uh, even if they grow for 100 years, they never flower. They don't, they're neither male nor female. They're simply juvenile. But because they're juvenile, uh, they're very good for uh, allergy-free gardens because they're pollen-free, but they don't trap pollen like a female plant. I, I really prefer the female plants when I can get them. Okay, so this is ragweed, and I just want to talk about ragweed for a second. Uh, in where I live, they in the fall when people have allergies, they the newspapers will blame it on ragweed, but we have very little ragweed out here. And uh, instead we have things like coyote bush, baccarus, which is used as a ground cover. And the forms that they sell are separate sexed and they only sell male forms. And so people plant this coyote bush ground cover all over the front yard and then every fall it produces a huge amount of pollen and the plant is a very close relative to ragweed and the pollen grains look like ragweed pollen which is like the photo I showed you earlier of a pollen grain. Uh, but to speak about ragweed what I wanted to say was that over a hundred years ago uh, on the Isle of Mont Montreal, 
uh, a group of citizens got together and they said, why don't we try to eradicate all the ragweed in Montreal on the entire island? And so they, they got church groups involved, they got the Boy Scouts, they got the Girl Scouts, uh, the Cub Scouts, the, the schools, they showed people pictures of what ragweed looked like when it was little, and they encouraged everybody to start killing ragweed whenever they saw it. And this program went on for quite a few years, and after about six years, they had virtually exterminated all the ragweed on the Isle of Montreal. And at that point, they started to advertise uh, in national and international publications, a lot of them in the United States, come to Montreal in the fall and get away from your, your ragweed allergy to we don't have any ragweed. And for 20 some years, they had no ragweed in Montreal. And then the original people got old and died and the uh, young people came along and they didn't keep it up. And last time I was in Montreal, which is a town I do love, there was ragweed growing everywhere. And uh, I would say that learn to know what ragweed looks like when it's just coming out of dormancy and it's like, particularly a plant that was there last year, because a lot of them were perennial. And you'll get a big rosette. And if you take and you hit that with a torch, um, and you can get it, you can put together a torch very cheap. Uh, all you need is a little butane tank and a little torch head, maybe $15, $20 total. And I like this better than using herbicides, but when it's in that low form, it's real low to the ground, just when the snow all melts, one of the first things you'll see start popping up are these ragweeds. You burn the center out of them and you'll kill the ragweed. But instead of just people complaining about things like ragweed, I like to see people actually try to do something about it. Um, if I lived in Canada and I had any ragweed, I mean any in my yard, I'd be embarrassed. Um, I've got a very large garden uh, and I've probably got 500 trees in pots here. I've got a greenhouse. I got very few weeds and, and I, it's not from using herbicides. I chop them, I pull them, I smother them with mulch, but I don't, I don't like weeds uh, in the garden. I particularly wouldn't like ragweed. All right, a little bit more about the motivation of why I'm talking to you, um, why I'm here. Uh, no allergenic male clonal, should have been clonal male, but whatever. Allergy causing plants, shrubs, or trees should be planted in any schoolyard in the province of Ontario. Um, now, this is a it's a little fellow, his name is Ryan. He was eight years old. And uh, I never met Ryan, but I met his teachers and I met his parents. And uh, he died of an asthma attack in the springtime. And uh, he had allergies and he loved to play baseball. And everybody said he was a very cheerful, fun kid. And this is me sitting in between his mom and his dad and the school principal. And those small trees around us are female trees that I grew from cuttings and gave to the school to uh, plant. They wanted to plant a tree in, in his honor, but they didn't wanna plant anything that would cause allergies or asthma. And so they found me and asked me, could I, could I donate a tree or two to them? and uh, I went there, it was very powerful uh, meeting his parents. Uh, I could feel their loss. I've got four children of my own and I would hate to have lost a little, a little kid like that. It, even one, it's not worth it. Uh, I would tell you real briefly while this photo is sitting there, uh, in, 
1990, I believe it was, in the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, a school took their kids to the city zoo. And a boy about the same age as this boy, he was actually a year younger, I think he was seven, six or seven. And he tripped running and he tripped and he fell into a bed of male junipers. And it was springtime and the, they were full of pollen and a big cloud of smoke pollen came up and the boy came up coughing and all the kids thought it was funny. After a while, the teachers realized they didn't see the little boy and they started looking for him and, and they found him finally huddled up under a park bench. And he was in full anaphylactic shock and they rushed him to the hospital and he died. And in Albuquerque, there, was, there used to be an old professor of botany called Dr. Potter. And I talked to him on the phone once, a lovely old guy. And Potter told me that he had realized that in Albuquerque, they were planting thousands of male trees and male shrubs, and very few females, and that the allergies were getting worse and worse and worse because of this, and that nobody was paying any attention to it. And when he heard about the little boy that died at the zoo, and that little boy's parents were told to get a hold of him, and he told them, the city's landscape kills your son, which is true. And the parents sued the city of Albuquerque, and Albuquerque uh, settled out of court. But part of the agreement was that they, they enacted one of the first pollen control ordinances city pollen control ordinance and there are other cities are there are no canadian cities that have a pollen control ordinance not a one but they started the first pollen control ordinance and in the beginning they basically said you couldn't sell or plant any of these separate sex plants anymore no use no junipers no mulberries no ash and so on uh, and on and on and so someone told me about it. And so I got a hold of the people there and I said, well, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And what you want to ban is the sale and planting of male of these species, not female. You want the females. And so Albuquerque changed it. And uh, it's not the only city to put a ban on uh, male plants. This was in Toronto, I was going for a walk and I was, uh, and Johnson and Johnson was paying my expenses and I was staying in a fancy hotel and there was a ash tree uh, near, the, near the hotel and it looked like it was about to start shedding pollen, but it wasn't. And I picked off a little branch and I brought it to back to my hotel room and set it on the desk and when I picked it up started to pick it up in the morning pollen just started falling off of this so I put a made a sign said male ash tree and took a photo but um, this is just from a little tiny one big male ash tree can pretty much uh, well it can pollute a large area all right a few little interesting facts Persistent pollen exposure during infancy is associated with increased risk of childhood asthma and hay fever. Newborns whose first few months in life coincide with high pollen seasons are at increased risk of developing early symptoms of asthma. Uh, asthma is a lifelong illness. Once you have it, you can try to control it, but there's really no cure for it. Uh, a lot of people die from it, including a lot of kids. Uh, an allergist told me once, he said, uh, I'm most interested in working with the kids that have allergies, because if somehow we can keep them from getting asthma, then we can do them such a huge favor for the whole rest of their life. This is my la latest book on uh, the subject, The Allergy Fighting Garden. This 
published by Random House Publisher. Uh, and uh, this is already in a second edition. My first one, Allergy Free Gardening, went through a number of editions. Um, if if you're not, I would almost guarantee that your library should have a copy of this book. So if you don't want to spend 15, 20 bucks and buy a copy yourself, uh, then go to the library and get it or something, but, uh, or buy a used copy, I, it doesn't matter. But uh, it, if you're a serious gardener, this is something you ought to know about. Um, well, I, I certainly think so. And I consider myself, uh, I've been gardening since I was a little child. I'm, I'm, I hybridize my own roses. I hybridize my own fruit trees. Uh, I propagate wide range of plants, not just allergy friendly ones, but I prefer allergy friendly ones. Heavy pollen exposure by pregnant mothers more than doubles the chance of a child developing asthma. Um, that's important to know. And it's important that uh, pregnant mothers are not living in a household that is uh, landscaped so that every spring and summer they get bombarded with these huge amounts of pollen. Uh, remember, it's again, all about proximity. Newborns who first few months of life coincide with high pollen seasons are at increased risk of developing asthma. Um, by the way, uh, <laughs> I don't normally have a big beard and I've got my hair in a, in a ponytail. Uh, this is my COVID look. I, I have my wife and I, uh, particularly because of my wife and her asthma, I, we've been extremely careful and social distancing. I have not been to a barber in over a year now. Uh, and since I quit cutting my hair, I quit shaving. <laughs> so this is, this is my COVID look. Uh, okay, now I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. And if I can even get just a handful of you to do it, I, then, I, then it will have been worthwhile for me to have done this talk. Um, write down Urban Forest Strategy, City of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and then Google it. And this is something that I was doing some work on what I was going to talk to you about today. And I, uh, I got an email alert on this just today. And I saw that the city of, Can uh, of Hamilton is developing an urban forest strategy, which they have never done before. And they are inviting they are inviting response from people who live in the area, which is you. And so please look up Google Urban Forest Strategy City of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and, and go to it and find out the part, find out where they want the, you to leave. It'll, you'll see it. They're asking for comments and make comments. Please stop planting highly allergenic trees in our cities and please start planting more allergy friendly trees, plant more female trees. You need to goad these people. You need to push them in order to get them to do something. But for anyone who actually take the trouble to do that, I'm extremely appreciative. And uh, I would love to see something about the city of Hamilton getting right on it. I know that uh, the Catholic schools in the city of Hamilton are already interested in this. And uh, I believe they've stopped planting any highly allergenic plants. I don't know if they've removed ones, uh, but if you would do that, that would be great. So a call to action. So, I'm calling you to act. I'm asking, I'm asking you to get involved. Uh, if you're skeptical about what I'm telling you, uh, you think I'm oversimplifying it. Uh, 
I encourage you to look me up, Google me. Uh, I have written uh, all over the place. I've written op-eds for the New York Times, the London Times. Uh, I've been published by in peer review work for Oxford University Press in London. Um, I just co-wrote a paper with the head of the USDA Urban Forestry, uh, which is coming out. Uh, my credentials are quite good, and I do know. I, I there's a billion things I don't know, but I do know a lot about allergies and plants and the connections. And I'm asking you, I'm begging you to uh, take some action. And uh, I would love to get some feedback from your group from the people who contacted me in the beginning to let me know if, uh, if, if I have any effect, if, if this actually happens, call to action. So that's the first thing I want you to do. The second thing, this is a friend of mine named Peter Pracky. He's uh, 88 years old and he lives uh, in Hamilton. I've stayed at his house, drank his homemade wine fine old filler, originally from Holland. He's a nurseman, educator, uh, done a lot of things. But he's very interested in uh, promoting the concepts of uh, allergy-friendly and allergy-free, particularly when it comes to schools. You'll notice that on his shirt, it says Bravery Park. And he along with the mother of a soldier from Canada, a Canadian soldier who died in Afghanistan. Uh, they started promoting the idea, and now it's becoming to fruition of bravery parks. And there's a number of bravery parks already being built as I'm speaking, and hopefully they're gonna pop up across Canada. And each bravery park is gonna be named to honor some Canadian soldier who died fighting in the Middle East, uh, which is a very worthy cause. And the reason I mention that is that the bravery parks, all of them are gonna be done allergy friendly. They're gonna stack them with female trees. Um, bravery parks, look up bravery parks and get involved in that. They could sure use your help. Uh, The Allergy Friendly Schoolyard is a website started by the same young fellow, Peter Pracky. And the whole purpose of it is to promote allergy friendly schoolyards. Little children need, they need to get outside. And they need, when they do, they run and they, they jump and they, there's so much more vigorous than an old guy like me. <laughs> and then some. But, as a result, little children will, at play, will breathe in and out four times as many times in the same period of time as an adult would. And that means if there's a lot of allergenic pollen where they're playing, they will access four times as much pollen. And because they're young, their immune systems are not as strong. And, and so the pollen is much more detrimental to these children. Um, I'd like to see all the cities do it. And uh, I've given talks on this, I mean, all around the world, uh, in Israel, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, five different times just in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm scheduled to uh, talk at a convention of arborists in uh, London on August 6th. Now, I, I don't know, and I, I know none of us do, whether or not th that will come off. Uh, oh, I am so delighted to tell you that uh, today's Wednesday. On Friday, my wife Yvonne and I are going to get our first... Uh, vaccine injection and uh, I couldn't be happier about it. Um, COVID has not been much fun. There's a little bit more of my motivation. 
There's my two little granddaughters, Annika on the left, nine, Raina, who's seven. And uh, I don't want them to have allergies. I don't want them to have asthma. I just want them to grow up and be healthy and have a enjoy life as much as you can. And uh, I could tell I'm getting to the end of my slides, uh, but I hope I have time for some questions. I have no idea how much time I've used here, not even a clue, but uh, I was camping. I camp a lot and uh, I go birding a lot and I go fishing a lot and I camp a lot. And I was camping out in the middle of nowhere and about 5.30 in the morning, just sun up, it was summertime. I see this crazy looking animal come up to my campsite. And uh, my son-in-law took this guy's picture looking at it. And I look at that face, I thought that just about, and he was a crazy looking animal. I, the only time I ever saw one, I, I, uh, one of the cutest things I ever saw, it was the Kuda Mundi. And why do I put that in there? Just because I liked his looks. It really didn't have anything to do with allergies. And so I'm getting to the point, uh, and there's three hour time or a difference, but I think I've deserved uh, a drink. Uh, and now uh, maybe I can take some, some questions and see if we can do that uh should i hit stop share you can hit stop share if you're done sharing okay now um and i've got the, i don't know if you can see the chat but i can ask you the chat questions if you like yeah okay fine okay this is I'm inga just, uh, i'm going through them here is am i talking quite a to few is is it inga or judy that i'm talking it's to? judy you're talking to right now so i'm going to thank you Tom, that was very interesting. I'm gonna start off with a question. There are a lot of plants that don't have male and female separate plants. Yes. How are they for pollen? Uh, they're all different and that's the problem. So, so for if, example- So if we plant okay. them, are they better? In general, they are better, all right? But there are exceptions. And so if you take like an apple tree, uh, apple trees don't cause a lot of allergies. Uh, almost nothing in the rose family triggers allergies. For some reason, the pollen is just not as allergenic. Uh, but if you take a tree like a catalpa tree, uh, it's perfect flowered. It has male and female in the same flower. It has big showy flowers. Uh, insects visit the flower. And, yet, and the pollen doesn't move very far. But if you have a big catalpa tree in your own yard, uh, chances are pretty good that uh, down the road, you or somebody in your family or a number of people will develop allergies to it. Uh, those are the sort of things. I spent 20, 30 years looking at data from allergists to see which things popped up the most and which appeared to be the most allergenic. But in general, if now bear in mind, there's another form called monaceous, and that would be like, like an oak tree. An oak tree has male flowers and female on the same tree, but not in the same flowers. So the male flowers are separate sex. And this is common with what we call monaceous plants. And a lot of monaceous plants are very allergenic. And if you look at like uh, corn, as you grow sweet corn in your, in your garden, the corn is monaceous. Uh, the flowers are imperfect and unisexual. And the tassels at the top are, are the male flowers and the ears of corn are the clusters of the female flowers. But in this case, the pollen is heavy and dense and it has a high specific gravity and quite large. And it's designed to fall from the top to the bottom and pollinate the corn. Now, if we have other plants like a cypress where you have both sexes on the same tree, 
but all the male flowers are on the bottom and the females are up on the top. Well, in that case, nature designed that pollen to go into the air and it causes a huge amount of allergies. So, um, but in general, to answer that question, yeah, the, the, the perfect flowered plants are generally less allergenic. So we have another question, Tom. Yeah. And uh, Lorraine is asking why an increase of CO2 in the atmosphere leads to the pollen grains exploding. That was early on. Okay, uh, let me back off a bit. Uh, I've been doing nursery work uh, pretty much my whole life. And in the old days, uh, in the greenhouses, we would take a flat, we'd take a nursery flat and fill it full of manure from cattle. And we would put those under the benches in the greenhouses. And what that did was as it decomposed, it would give off a lot of CO2 carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide acts as a, like a steroid for plants. It, it makes them bloom faster and more. And so when we have trees in a city and we double the amount of CO2 and we're now at the highest CO2 levels in our urban areas that we've ever been in history. And uh, our trees, particularly the male trees, will be getting all this carbon dioxide and then they will start producing all this more pollen. And then at the same time, they're getting exactly the same amount of fertilizer and water, which is not much either. And so the trees are getting stressed. And I misspoke, it's not really the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is responsible for the quantity of the pollen. Uh, what is splitting the, making it burst in the air is, uh, are the air pollutants in the air. And in particular, any area that has acid rain will have a lot of fractured pollen. And acid rain is fairly common in the Northeast of America where you are. But uh, this, there's another thing that will split pollen. Uh, I gave a talk a couple of years ago in Melbourne and I was there shortly after they'd had a, a one day where the city of Melbourne had thousands of people flooding all the emergency rooms uh, all the hospitals because they were having asthma attacks. And a lot of these people had never had asthma before in their life. And what was happening was that there was a lot of pollen in the air. And then they had these thunderstorms and the electricity in the air was exploding the pollen grains. And people were sucking down way deep into their lung these little tiny fragments of pollen. I mean, a typical pollen grain is only 20 microns in diameter, it's very small. If it was sitting in the palm of your hand, you couldn't even see one grain. You only see pollen in clumps normally. But when you fracture that, you can imagine how small it gets. And then, like I said, the inside is more allergenic than the outside. So um, that's how we get this fractured pollen. So the next question, Tom, is, yeah. uh, uh, so people are planting a lot of pollinator gardens now to encourage our native bees. We just wondered what the impact on native bees would do if they were drastically fewer male trees planted because those bees rely on pollen. Has any been any research been done on what happens with you cut down the, the male flower uh, trees and then what effect does that have on the bees? Okay, so uh, when pollinated trees uh, are rarely visited the males are rarely ever visited by bees. And, uh, um, and female separate sex trees almost always have nectar sources. And so bees do visit them. And uh, I'm extremely interested in pollinators and uh, I would encourage everybody here to plant milkweeds for the, for the butterflies. Uh, and other plants that the pollinators like. Um, my yard always has bees and it 
And in the summer, it's full of butterflies and many different species. And by the way, I noticed that uh, orange butterflies like orange flowers and uh, yellow butterflies like yellow flowers, uh, uh, white butterflies like white flowers, it's a crazy thing, but uh, uh, definite uh, preference there. But uh, I would also say that uh, I don't, uh, I've been organic gardening uh, and organic farming. I used to be a farmer too. And uh, I don't use a lot of pesticides. And what I normally do, it's something like neem or soap and, uh, oh, maybe baking soda. And uh, I think the pollinators are very important. And I think they are stressed and I think we should do everything that we can. I would also, because I'm a birder and, uh, and I appreciate birds, I would say that uh, female plants provide fruit and seeds that birds and other wildlife eat. Male plants produce uh, nothing that these uh, birds can eat. Um, and I'm not calling for the elimination of all male plants for, for crying out loud. What I'm trying to do is get some sensibility into it. Uh, I remember when I went through like uh, Edmonton, Canada, uh, probably 98% of the trees in Edmonton were of four species. All the species were dioecious, separate sex. And 100% of what I saw planted was male. 100% of those species, the plants sold in the nurseries there were male. And yet, as soon as I went into the wild land, even a block away, I always saw a balance. I never saw just uh, male poplar trees. I saw male and female. I saw a mix and, and a balance. And right now we don't have a balance, therefore we need to go the other direction. But I'm totally in favor of pollinators and I'm totally in favor of pollinator planting. And, uh, and I think having masses of, of interesting pollinator friendly uh, annuals and perennials in your yard is just another way to make every, the whole yard healthier for everybody, including the pollinators. Um, but that was a good question, I appreciate it. And this one is kind of a follow-up to that. Someone's uh -huh. wondering what ratio of male to female trees would you need to ensure re reproduction of the trees? Okay, I would say in the first place, if you worked in the nursery industry on the propagation end, you would realize that almost no trees are grown from seed anymore. Almost all are grown mostly from tissue culture or cuttings or grafting or budding. And uh, which is not to say seed isn't important, but uh, in, in, in California where the pistachio uh, growers are and all the pistachio trees, which are related to sumacs, which are also separate sex, uh, they use, they don't want a lot of male trees because the male trees don't have any pistachio nuts. So they find that one male for every 50 females and they'll get a good crop of uh, pistachios uh, with uh, another nut called jojoba, which they grow for jojoba oil out in the desert. They find that uh, sometimes one male for every 100 females will still give you a good uh, crop of nuts. Uh, in the date palms, uh, almost all the trees you'll see will be female, but they will grow big male date palms and they'll use the pollen from that to pollinate the females. Um, in the old biblical days, um, they called the, the male palms uh, bull palms, but uh, it's in the city, we really don't have to worry about uh, lack of production. Uh, by and large, most of the trees that are going in are getting planted, and the other ones are birds dropping seeds. And again, uh, with the separate sex species, if you don't have the females, you don't have any seeds. So we have quite a few people thanking you. 
Uh, another question was, uh, given that, as you said, the nursery trade is primarily selling uh, male uh, cultivars, how do we yes. get our nurseries to start selling more female trees and shrubs? You know, it's a very good question and, and I don't know. I have been to the biggest nurseries in your area and, and uh, pitched them on this and uh, laid it out for them and every one of them shut me down. Uh, and uh, I have talked to nurserymen in your area uh, who a few months from now when things warm up will be uh, loading and unloading trucks full of uh, thousands of one gallon and five gallon ewes, uh, most of which are male. And they tell me that uh, at the end of the day, they're just covered in pollen. And uh, more than one nurseryman from Canada has questioned whether all that exposure to that uh, pollen from these male uses, why the nurserymen have such a high rate of uh, uh, what's the illness you get from uh, sometimes too many blows to the head or something like that? Um, Concussion. Parkinson's disease, yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, I would ask them because there are nurserymen who, who have my book. And, uh, and if they have it and read it, they'll help you and they will go out of their way. I'm not, nurserymen aren't bad people, they're good people. It's just, uh, they need to be convinced. And just like that link I showed you about the city of Hamilton, um, they need to be convinced. In my own city, they were planting many allergenic plants for years and years and years, even though I was going on about it everywhere, writing about it. And eventually, not too long ago, uh, they invited me to come for breakfast, the urban foresters of the city. And then uh, they invited me to come for lunch. And now they've changed their whole way of going about it. They don't, they don't plant any more milk clones in the city where I live. And, and it just all got done off of cooperation. It, we didn't even have to have a, a rule or a law about it. But uh, I mean, allergies, by in the United States anyhow, and they're quite bad in Canada too. Uh, by 1999, 38% of Americans had allergies and it's probably worse now. Uh, there's been what's called an epidemic of allergy and an epidemic of asthma. These are very costful. I mean, you talk to somebody who has bad allergies, they'll tell you it's no walk in the park. It's not a picnic. It's, it's uh, annoying, it makes you feel blousy. You don't have the energy you should. You don't, harder to focus. Kids in school that have allergies don't do as well on tests and so on. They can't study as well because they don't feel well. And if they get asthma, it's even worse. There are big costs to society because we just go about this willy-nilly and we act like, or we'll plant a million new trees. We don't give a fig about what kind of trees we plant, but all plants are not the same. I would ask you, you know, would you rather have an apple tree or would you rather have poison ivy? Uh, I'd rather have an apple tree. You know, would you rather have a, a tomato plant or a thistle? I'll take the tomato plant. I mean, plants are all like people. They're all different and trees the same way. And uh, we can control asthma and allergy, not, we don't totally control anything, but we can make a huge influence on it by just reducing the amount of triggers that everybody is exposed to all the time. And so if they don't know about it, talk to your nursery people. Um, nursery people depend on people like us. We're the people who buy plants. We spend money on it. We, we get out in the garden and we get our hands dirty uh, and we don't mind, we like it. <laughs> Good. The uh, next question is, is the opal scale, is that in your books? Yes, it is. Every it is plant 10. has a number and the number runs from one to 10. One is allergy free, usually female, but not always. And 10 is pretty much guaranteed allergies. Uh, but it's in all of my books, yes. Now, do you, we've also got a few questions of people wondering about recommended plants for this area. 
do your books include uh, recommended plants? Yes. In zones? Yes, they do. Yes, okay. they do. My books are used worldwide. And uh, so I have to, I have, I mean, I, I go places, I'm expected to know every single plant I see. I'm supposed to know what kind of tree everywhere, <laughs> no matter where I am. And, um, and that's all right, you know, it's a challenge, but, uh, and I'm not saying I always know, but uh, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm experienced at working with nursery people all around the world, and uh, and 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 it's important to have plants that will thrive in your area. Uh, by the way, we were talking about bugs earlier, and I mentioned the benefit of little birds like warblers and bush tits and tit mice and so on that eat so many insects. If if you plant a plant that just doesn't is not going to grow well in your area, uh, but it does grow just because it's tough. Often that plant will grow, but it will fail to thrive, and then it will become a magnet for insects. And then after a while, it's producing insects and uh, insect dander and mold and mold spores. Um, and then we would do what Rosarians call shovel prune it. We just dig it up and toss it and plant something else. But uh, it's important. That's another reason that if you can use natives, use natives. But people seem to think that natives uh, haven't been corrupted as far as allergy goes. And natives have been corrupted more than anything else. Uh, uh, an awful lot of our very most allergenic uh, clones are all native. Um, and the same holds true in other countries as well. Uh, when I was in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, their native tree, their, I mean, the tree for, for the South Island is called Totara. And the Totara is a U relative. And like the U, it's poisonous. And like the U, it's separate sex. And I walked around Christchurch for, pretty much a whole day with the head arborist from the city of Christ Church, in which case we saw dozens and dozens of these totaris growing. We couldn't find one single female totara. But as soon as we went out into the wild land outside of the city, we found plenty of them. And what was happened was that horticulture had been manipulated and they said, oh, people don't want females because they're messy. So we'll grow males and <laughs> That's what they've done. The, the phenomenon is the same everywhere. Uh, it's true. I mean, I get emails from professors of horticulture in places like Iran, you know, and their problems are very similar. Uh, same kind of thing. Uh, we, the, our next question is, are the common lawn grasses high on your allergy scale? Okay, the, the, the common lawn grasses, particularly like bluegrasses and so on, uh, if you keep them mowed, they won't bloom and they're not gonna be allergenic unless they bloom. But the problem is, and I used to live in Minnesota, so I know this is like you mow your lawn and then you fertilize it and then it rains for five days straight and the lawn grows like mad. And then when you're gonna mow it, it starts to rain again. So you don't get it mowed and then it flowers. Then it's causing a lot of pollen. Uh, the the fescues are easier to control uh, the bloom than the others, and I would I would encourage things like fescue blends. Uh, there are, by the way, there are if a person is willing to do the digging and stuff, there are all kinds of interesting grasses that now that are. Uh, what they call interspecific or intergeneric hybrids. These are hybrids between different species or hybrids between different uh, genres sometime. And, uh, and those grow like mad and they generally spread by rhizomes underground, but they're, they're, all of them are male sterile. And so they don't produce any pollen. And so 
I would like to see the day come, and I don't know, I'm, I'm getting old, but <laughs> I, I, it'll happen someday that that pasture land around cities will have to be used these intergeneric hybrids. And they grow perfectly well. And uh, cattle like the hay and they like the forage and, uh, but they don't produce pollen. But uh, um, also I would say that lawns often get a bad rap because remember the picture I showed of the maple, male maple and all the pollen you, well, you could see the pollen on the sidewalk or the street, but you couldn't see the pollen on the grass. It doesn't mean that there wasn't pollen on the grass, but the pollen on the pollen lands on grass and it tends to go down. It ends up uh, as thatch or something. So pollen that lands on grass is generally gets taken out of circulation a, a, a lot quicker than uh, than if it lands on hard surfaces. And I, I'd much rather see a nice lawn than cement. Thanks for that. A couple of people have asked about recording. We are recording this. It will end up on the Nature Guelph YouTube channel at some point, but I can't guarantee quite when, because okay. uh, we are Would run you... by volunteers and the webmaster's a little slow. And then one of the final questions for you, send, Tom. Send, is... me a, send me a link to that one. It has. I will do that, Tom. I'll send you a copy of that. that. Sure. Um, the final question would be, do you know of any cities who are moving to a model of planting mostly native tree species to increase genetic and species diversity and using female as well as male plants? Okay, I, I would say this, and I have been to many, many high level top tree people in the world, you know, and, and the feeling is, is that if you limit yourself to what is native in your own geographical area, then you are getting less species biodiversity in the city. And what we want is more biodiversity. By the way, there's like a, in Berkeley, California, there's a street called Mulberry Street. And it's lined for two miles on both sides of the street with mulberry trees. And there's not one single mulberry produced on any of them because they're all male clones. That creates what they call a pollen corridor or an allergy corridor. And when they bloom, a lot of people get sick. And that whole idea of like monoculture approach to landscape is not a good idea. I don't, I used to think all that stuff looked cool but long before I started studying allergies, but now I look at it and it looks offensive. I like to see landscapes that are as biodiverse as possible. And as far as cities, there are, there are quite a few cities that are trying to make attempts to plant more female trees, that's true. And there are plenty of cities that are trying to plant more native trees. And a lot of times the native trees in the area are ignored and that's a bad idea. The native trees have a lot going for them. Uh, but, uh, but overall, my, my feeling is that uh, life is short and horticulture is a deep interest of mine. And I like in my own gardens to grow plants from all around the world. And I like to grow natives from California, but uh, I would hate to be just stuck growing just California natives. It's, uh, it's not as much fun. It's not as interesting. It won't give me as many pollinators in my garden. And uh, it just limits what I can do. And it, it would decrease the biodiversity of my own yards. And I like my yards to be as biodiverse as possible. Are you there? I mute myself. Um, I don't see any more <laughs> questions in the chat. So I think we've exhausted people unless anybody's got more questions. Thanks a lot, Tom. This was a, a very interesting. I, I expected it would be a little more controversial because I know a lot of the people on the call today are uh, big fans of pollinators. But I think you explained uh, very much that we can still have our pollinators and but just be careful what we do in the in the city. So thanks oh, oh, a lot. Abs absolutely, I'm not an enemy of pollinators, just the opposite. And by the way, if anybody is here and they got a 
a lingering burning question or something, you know, send me an email. I answer my own email, which most writers don't do. And I leave my email out there. And uh, you Google me and you'll find it quick enough. It's not, it's not hard to get a hold of me. And I will answer your questions to the best of my ability. Uh, but uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate everybody that listened to it. And uh, thanks for asking me in the first place. And uh, God bless everybody and stay safe. And uh, let's hope 2021 turns out better than last year. All right. Okay. I'm just going to say a few words. We missed our intro. Uh, yeah. Nature Guelph next month. Uh, this is the last of the joint series we've been doing with Tweak. Uh, next month, we'll have a, a seed workshop um, with Nature Guelph. You can find that on the Nature Guelph website. And you can find it all about how to grow native plants. And I think Inga, do you have anything to say about Tweak and, and uh, trees for Woolwich and what you're going to be planting? Uh, for those of you who uh, are interested and who are in the Trees for Woolwich catchment area, uh, we're busy planning our spring planting season. Um, there will be assorted dates, but there is definitely a date on the 15th of May where we will be uh, planting up the, um, the part of the habitats, our six acre uh, restoration project. Um, and uh, there'll be a really interesting mix of trees going in there. Now that I've listened to this, maybe I should make sure that we have some females going in there. Um, and uh, please stay tuned. Uh, you'll, you'll get notices, uh, certainly with respect to all the planting dates, they will also be posted on our website. And I'll just put another plug in for Nature Guelph. If you check out the Nature Guelph Facebook page, uh, you'll find some suggested things to do with yourself and your family and your bubble during COVID. So we have outings posted and uh, on our next, uh, in our next few talks. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks uh, Trees for Woolwich. Uh, we've had an interesting three series with you and I'm really going to thank Tom. I've heard about Tom a number of years ago. I think I may have heard him on the radio and it's really, really nice to hear him and see him, what he, see him for, for, for real. So thanks a lot, Tom. You're welcome. Bye, guys. And thanks, everybody, for coming in, and we'll see you next time.